Hello, statistics students. This is your instructor, Dr. Todd Daniel. And today, I'm going to teach you how to use JASP for hypothesis testing using a one-sample z-test. Well, what is a one-sample z-test? It is a parametric procedure that tests whether a sample mean is statistically significantly different than a population mean. And we use it when we know the standard deviation of the population. In this example, I have a population with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 11. And I want to test whether my mean of 150, a sample that has been drawn from that population, is different than the mean of 100. Manu's Manufacturing produces ball bearings that should have a diameter of 0 0.50 millimeters. To maintain quality control, each hour, a sample of 30 ball bearings is randomly selected for testing. To be within specification, the bearings must deviate by no more than 0 0.06 millimeters on average. This measure of deviation is going to serve as our standard deviation, and the mean will be 0.5. That is the measurement that the population of ball bearings should maintain. We are going to use this setup and our five steps of hypothesis testing to walk through and determine what kind of test we will use, then set up and run that test. Let's see what we have. We have one sample which has been drawn from a population. That sample has a mean, and the specifications will serve as a mean and a standard deviation for the population. Therefore, this is the perfect setup to use a one-sample z-test. Having established that, let's review the assumptions for a one-sample z-test. The independent variable should be a single sample, and that is what we have. They are ball bearings. This is a categorical variable, where the variable simply is ball bearings. We were told in the word problem that the ball bearings have been randomly selected. The dependent variable would be something that we measure. In this case, the diameter of the ball bearings. We can add up, divide by n, and get an average for the diameter of the ball bearings in our sample. We should also look at our data set to make sure we don't have any extreme outliers, missing data. We know from the random selection that the data should be independent, and we can check for normality with our software. The settings for a one sample z test begin with a null hypothesis that the sample mean is the same as the population mean. The sample should be the same as the population from which it was drawn. We would write this in symbols using h sub 0 colon mu equals mu sub 0, where we will substitute a number, and that number will be the actual population mean, in this case, a 0.5. That leaves us with our alternative hypothesis, that the sample mean does not equal the population mean, and we would write that as h sub 1 colon mu does not equal mu sub 0, where we will substitute the same number as we did in the null hypothesis for the population mean. Typically, we set our alpha level to 0 0.05, which for a normal distribution means that with a two-tailed test, alpha of 0 0.05, our critical value will be positive and negative 1.96 for the upper and lower tail. If we were doing a one-tailed test, then at a 0 0.05, our critical value would be either positive 1.645 or negative 1.645, depending upon the direction of change that we were looking for. Knowing the typical settings, let's use those for step two, where we establish our null and alternative hypotheses. Our research question asks whether the sample ball bearings are different from specification. For our null hypothesis, we would write this in words as Sample ball bearings are no different than specification. And in symbols, that would be h sub 0 colon mu equals 0 0.500. 0. 
that is the mean of the population. For the alternative hypothesis, knowing that we are doing a two-tailed test, we would say the sample ball bearings are different than specification, not indicating a direction of change. And in symbols, h sub 1 colon mu equals 0 0.500, the same mean of the population as we used for our null hypothesis. Why are we using a two-tailed test? Because changes in either direction we want to know about. They're both bad. If the bearings are too big or if the bearings are too small, either way they would be out of specification. Changes in either direction are things that we want to know about. That brings us to step three. Let's set our criteria for significance. We are using a two-tailed test with an alpha level of 0 0.05. Using a normal distribution, our critical value will be positive or negative 1.96. And now we are ready to calculate the statistics. And for that, we will go to JASP. You can see that I have my data in an Excel spreadsheet here on the desktop. Let's begin by opening that up in Excel. Now, if you are enrolled in my statistics class, then you will be using this first tab, ball bearings, for your test. This data consists of a column of data. That's our independent variable, our one sample of ball bearings. Each of the data points will make up our dependent variable. These are measures of the diameter of the ball bearings, which can be averaged to get a sample mean. Now for this video, I am going to be using a different set of data called small bearings. Also measures of the diameters of ball bearings, but the results will be different from what you would get using the ball bearing data set. This way you know how to do the test and you can do it yourself with your own data. Because we're using JASP, we should begin by saving this data out as a CSV, or a Comma Separated Values Workbook. I'll save it to the desktop. It is going to save the second of the tabs, the small bearings data, as a CSV, which will land right there on our desktop. I'm going to put Excel away and open up JASP. Just in case you need to know, I'm using JASP 14.1. I go to Open, Computer, Desktop, and there's my ball bearings.csv data set. Click to open. Here's the numbers, just as I saw them in Excel. To do a one sample Z test, we're actually going to go to the T test menu and we will use a one sample t-test as our option. But we're not going to actually do a t-test, we will substitute a z-test. Now it's important to know that there is a bug that is known to the developers that if we try to use the effect size it will ignore the test value, so we'll just close that warning and we won't get an effect size. But we will move our data into the variables box, and because of JASP progressive disclosure, we're already starting to see the output. As I said, we're going to do a z-test, not a t-test, so I will deselect student's t-test. To do a z-test, we need both a test value and a standard deviation, the test value being the sample mean of 0.500. The standard deviation, you recall, our values could deviate by no more than 0 0.06. Now we have our z-test and our probability value, but we want a little bit more than that. Let's get our normality check. Let's also get our location estimate, which will give us a 95% confidence interval. We'll skip effect size for now, but we will get descriptive plots and descriptives. There's our descriptive plot. I'm going to resize that and our descriptive statistics. The assumptions check, we see the probability is a 0.8. This is non-significant, meaning that our data pass the assumption check for normality. We want our assumptions checks to be non-significant, meaning that our data do not differ from the assumption. Having checked the assumption for normality and knowing that the data pass, 
I'm going to now deselect this assumptions check just to give myself more space. Well, now we're ready to interpret these data. I'm going to open up our results a little bit wider so I can see them a bit more clearly. Let's see how we would interpret these data points. Remember, our critical value was 1.96, but our z-score is a 14.9, which exceeds 1.96, suggesting that these findings are statistically significantly different. Our p-value is less than 0 0.05, in fact, less than 0 0.001. And our confidence interval for the sample mean does not include the mean of the population, which is a 0.5. Our sample mean is 0.336. This is the confidence interval around that mean. If the confidence interval around the sample mean does not include the population value of 0.5, then the test is statistically significant. We get our descriptive statistics, the mean and standard deviation of the sample, right down here. Our sample size is 30. All of this we will need when we write up our test results. These results tell us all the same thing. The test is statistically significant. Our sample is different than our population. How do we interpret these findings? Our decision is to reject the null hypothesis. The hypothesis that says the sample mean and the population mean are the same. By rejecting the null hypothesis that the sample and population means are the same, we are concluding that the sample and population means are different, statistically significantly different, or that this sample of ball bearings is out of control. They are systematically too small to be within specification. Let's write this up in proper APA style. A sample of ball bearings was collected to determine whether the manufacturing process was in control. Based on findings from a one sample z-test, the sample of 30 ball bearings with a mean of 0.34 was statistically significantly smaller than the specifications for the process with a mean of 0.5 and a standard deviation of 0.06. The process should be stopped and the machine recalibrated to bring ball bearing production back into control. Current ball bearings are not suitable for use. And that is how we do a one sample z-test using JASP. Thanks for watching and be sure to check out the channel for other videos on how to do various statistical tests using JASP, SPSS, R, or Excel.